stockings that are on the left hand side. So when we purchase a macaw, we normally look inside the, the carry case because they would have obviously pooped in it. So right from the start, we'll be able to tell what diet that they've been on. Um, when we visit um, the breeder's complex, we always take a look at the environment that the, the parent birds are being kept in, plus the, the chick that we're purchasing. Um, you can tell a lot from the water bowls and the food bowls exactly what they've been eating, if the breeder's been actually attentive in cleaning water bowls, etc. Um, what type of uh, perches that they've been used to, if they've been on stainless steel perches, natural brows, if they have any uh, foliage in there, and um, again, we get to the bottom and we check the faeces. <clears throat> The health of the macaw for us is always the number one thing to look for. Um, and then it basically just goes through those things again that I've just spoken about. Um, that picture that's on the, the left hand side is a picture of um, a 22 day, I think, 21 day old in front and a 35 day old behind. So it's quite amazing the difference with all the macaws, how. Um, really 14 days, two weeks, the difference in them going from literally no feathers, bald, to nearly fully feathered. Um, another important thing to look for is um, if you're purchasing a, a chick, is that their feet shouldn't be black with um, most of the macaws. The, their feet should be light in colour like the picture on the left hand side. An older macaw will have much more scaly skin on the feet and we also um, we'll check for calluses and that on the back of the feet um, to see if they've actually been rubbing their feet, etc. And also check to make sure that they have all their toes. Um, generally in flocking aviaries, sometimes they can be missing a toe from one bird eating out another bird's toe. Um, eyes are also important. Um, if you look at the, the picture on the, the far right, right hand side, that's obviously of a mature blue and gold macaw. The buffon macaw in the middle um, is a young buffon, um, and you can actually tell that by the, the cloudiness of her eye. A, a baby blue and gold, a scarlet, a hans will also have that cloudiness. As they mature, the eye clears, and um, you can actually notice that the pupil will stand out a lot more. We also make sure that when we're looking at the macaws to find out if the actual bird is uh, following us around the aviary, if they're alert, or if they're actually sitting with squinted eyes. That will tell us that there's a problem with the, the bird, um, health-wise. Um, just not being alert, they should be, um, uh, their eyes should be really quite wide open and bright. Um, also, we check the mandibles. The mandibles are very important. Um, a lot of macaws that are, are hand-read, their uh, lower mandibles are actually um, uh, dislodged and can be quite unbalanced. It can be fixed by an avian vet, but very, very costly to do that. So we always make sure that we keep walking around the bird, checking the mandible, that they're um, completely straight. Also, um, the length of the mandible, if you're purchasing a young chick and it has a really long mandible, chances are it is not a young, a young bird that they're trying to sell you. As, as they mature, the mandibles get longer and ev about every three years we, we take our macaws in for a vet check and if need be we have them um, ground down a little bit. A lot of people don't believe in grinding them down, they think that once you start grinding them down um, this will, will make them actually grow faster. It doesn't make them grow faster because they use the perches in, the, in their aviaries to, to grind them down themselves but just some macaws don't grind down enough. Our, um, green wing macaws in the aviary have the sharpest mandibles and you can even see in the, the left hand picture their, the bottom of their mandible actually goes down to a really fine chisel point. The blue golds don't, they're not as um, uh, pronounced in, in grinding their beaks down but definitely the green wing macaws do. Uh, feathers, obviously we try to have a look at the feathers to make sure that they're um, they're clean and the environment that they've been kept in. So basically if they're full of dust and dirt, that would tell us that they've been on the ground a lot, or they're in a windy area that they're capturing all the dirt. 
Um, but again, that would just be a good wash to get rid of that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the lines in the feathers um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, we don't ever think about not purchasing a macaw because the chick has a ratty tail. Most macaw chicks at um, five to six months old will have the worst tails because of the enclosure that they've been kept in as a juvenile. Um, if they've been housed with other chicks, they'll also eat each other's tails and they're just not used to, to preening themselves. It probably takes two years for a macaw to actually start to appreciate the long tail that they've been given. Um, I don't have a good picture of a vent. I did try to get a, a picture of a macaw's vent, but it is extremely difficult to stand under a bird without it pooping on you and with a lens facing up to its private areas. So you'll just have to take my word that we were looking for a clean vent and not moist and um, any discharge from it. Um, the breathing, you should be looking for the, the chick to make sure that it's actually breathing smoothly and not out of breath. Uh, it obviously would be a little bit out of breath if it's flying around the aviary, but if it's stationary, the breathing should be just smooth and no wheezing noises. The wings, the wings should fall back evenly to the body. Um, if they do overlap, this does generally um, tell you that there has been interbreeding. Sometimes, that's not always the case. Sometimes when the bird is hot or frustrated, they'll actually drop their shoulders down, which will make those wings overlap. Um, so it's just something that you'd have to observe over an hour visit to the, to the actual breeders. Um, when they're fully opened, if we can actually handle the bird, we'll actually open the wings up to see if they've been um, destroying their, their wing feathers and if they'll be able to fly. As in the past, some people have purchased birds and feather-wise they look perfect. As soon as you open the wings up, they have no primary flight feathers, they've actually eaten them off. So they will be unable to fly if they've actually um, chewed them right back. Uh, the breastbone, we were actually talking about this this morning. Um, it's very important for you to actually feel the breastbone of the, the new macaw that you're purchasing, if, if you can. It should, be, um, it should protrude sharply and be in a straight line. If it's rounded, this would tell you that um, during parent rearing or hand rearing, the bird was lacking in vitamins, wasn't able to, to actually absorb the vitamins and minerals and the, the growth of the bird has been too fast for it to actually, uh, for the bone density. That can't be fixed. Uh, skin condition, uh, the bird that's actually on the right is a bird, that, um, a scarlet macaw, a Cianoptra that we purchased last year. Um, she was in a carry crate for 14 hours, and by the time she came out of the carry crate, that's what her underneath looked like. Her top looked even worse, plus so did the male, which I'll show you some pictures of them later. But we always take the birds to the avian vet to have a full health check. Um, you need to check the skin colour to make sure that it is a nice uh, pink tone, not yellow, which would tell you that there's uh, liver and kidney disease and we'll check for mites as well. Um, we actually have never found a mite on any of our macaws um, in the 10 years that we've had them. I think that's also because of the herbal and tea diet that they're on. Um, obviously those things will come out through the skin, which may be that the mites don't like. Uh, we check for also allergies and any rashing. Uh, feather condition, um, we look at the health of the the bird's feathers to make sure that they um, appear strong. Once we actually open out the wing shafts, we'll make sure that they're not thin and brittle. It will also indicate um, under the tail feathers if the bird has um, been kept in a small enclosure or a large enclosure, if they've actually been able to, to preen themselves properly. Um, sometimes the actual uh, shaft of the, the feathers haven't actually been broken and that's because the bird has been kept in a smaller cage and not been able to, to break that seal or doesn't know how to break that seal. Once you actually put it in with another bird that's um, been able to draw that, one bird will teach the other bird how to, to preen itself. This is the bird that I was just talking to you about that was in the, the carry crate. Um, 
It's probably the worst feather condition that we've ever seen. Um, both of them just look terrible, just stressed out in a, a carry crate. Um, the state that we purchased them from, we weren't allowed to actually transport food um, from one state to the other because of um, uh, the government laws. So for 14 hours, they, they weren't able to eat, only drink water. So that's what they did to them. Six months after using the tea sprays and good dye, that's how they look today. So you can still see that they've still got to molt out um, a lot of those feathers on the back, but the, the fronts of them have nearly, nearly completely refeathered. Their heads have completely refeathered um, and starting to get into really good condition now. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my passion, which is the subspecies of the scarlets. Um, at this stage, there's only the two subspecies that have been um, recognised and named, which is the Ara Mako Mako, which is from South America, and so in South America it's sometimes called the Bolivian. The Mako Sionoptera, also um, known as a Central American or a Nigiwagra. The third species is called the Ara Mexicana Scarlet, which is what we think it will be named, but it, as I said, still hasn't scientifically been named yet. And I will be showing you some photos of all three birds. Uh, this is a chart basically just showing you the, the main difference in them. Um, without sort of going into too much detail, basically um, the, the first column is talking about the mandible length, which is the length from the, the top of the nose to the tip. Um, second one is talking about the, um, the lower mandible, and again, that's from the, the base of the mandible to the, to the tip. Longest toe length, so from the, the top of the foot to where the nail starts, they take a length. And the wing cord is the length of the, the tip of the wing to the um, spine. So then it would be multiplied by two to get from tip to tip. So in the first, um, uh, first column, you can see that the Mako Mako is, sl is slightly smaller than the CM Notra by about 2.1 mil, which doesn't seem a lot but there is a difference. Um, in the second column with the mandibles, the mandible of the Cianoptera is 2.2 uh, mil longer than a Mako Mako. The toe length, um, uh, the toe length is, is only like one mil difference really. The wing core is 24.3 millimeters longer. So you're looking at um, 48 mil wingspan difference which is you know, nearly five centimetres, so quite big. What we don't have on the report is the actual body size. The body size is much larger. And again, I'll show you a picture of a comparison of two sitting um, side by side. The head size is again much larger as well. And um, the actual length of the body is, is longer on the sea and octra as well. Uh, this is a picture of the Mako Mako. Um, again called the Bolivian or the um, uh, Scarlet. It has a much narrower band than the, the Cianoptera, which is normally uh, two to three rows. It's separated by a green band. Um, I'm sure you can all see that. It has this green band just running along the, the tips. Uh, the body weight is, is for a hen is normally 1.1 kilos and a cock bird would be 1.2. It's found on the um, uh, east coast of Venezuela and also in Brazil, Peru and Bolivia. The colour of the, the red is more of an orange red than, than a blood red. This is also another picture of um, a Mako Mako, which is, is one of ours. Um, and again, you can see on her she does have that definite green band separating the yellow from the blue. The Aramaco SM Optra. This photograph was actually given to me by a gentleman from America, uh, Rick Jordan. This is one of his birds, and then you'll see one of our birds, which basically looks the same. Um, it has a much larger band of, of yellow through here, which is um, three to four bands. Um, and the very tips of the, the yellow, just through here, 
a buffed in blue, not green like the Mako Mako. Um, some of the Ceonoptras actually have blue spots throughout the feathers, but generally there's, there's no green present. Uh, the hen is much larger, she's at, um, just over one, or nearly 1.5 kilos, uh, yeah, 1.5 kilos, and the cockbird is 1.1 to 1.5. Um, our Ceonoptras that we have at home, our hens are at 1.3. Three. This data is probably about seven years old now, but our hens are at um, sorry 1.2, and our cockbirds are at 1.4. So they are nearly as large as our green wings. Um, and the red in them is a much more solid red in colour, and as I said, no green bands. This is a picture of um, a young sea opera, which we've named Pepper. Um, she actually came from a, a breeder on the um, west coast of Australia from um, Ella, Elamara Bird Park and she's now gone into our breeding program. That's him again on the, the vegetable bowl and he would be seven months old there. Above him is um, a Mako Mako. So you can see there's actually a difference here in the colour of the yellow. It's much duller than the Ceonoptera. Most Mako Makos have a green band around the top of their head. The Ceonopteras don't. And the tail length of the uh, Ceonoptera is 97 centimetres. But that's the measurements of our ones. Compared to the Mako Mako, which is about 76 centimetres. So there's a huge difference in the tail. And Probably not a great picture to see the, the body width of the um, Mako Mako above, but you can see how stocky the bird is at the bottom of the Ceonoptera. Um, this photograph was actually um, uh, given to me by a breeder in Australia, Damien Dunman, who just visited um, Costa Rica. So this is a wild Ceonoptera. So again, on this one, you can see there's more, more blue spotting but no, no green. Um, the picture on the right is uh, a flock aviary where they actually take in all the, um, the scarlets that have been injured or, or hit by cars. Um, they basically get them back into health again and then they re-release them. This is the Mexican scarlet, as I was saying, that hasn't been named. You can see straight away the colour variation is completely different. Um, there's hardly any yellow in them at all. There is another picture of this one, but just under this wing line here, there's one to two rows of yellow, so I'm told. Um, the blue in them is uh, a royal blue, so their, their flight feather through here is royal blue, whereas with the sea and opera, it's more of a navy blue. And when you actually see the three photos together, you can actually see the difference quite easily. Um, they are much smaller than both the other scarlets, their only um, weight is 908 grams. Um, and as I said, generally one to two rows of the yellow. And I'll just bring up the picture of the three of them so you can see. So this is another picture of not the same bird, but you can just see the row of yellow through there. And as it stands today, this is the only Mexican that we have in Australia. After three years of researching, we have found one, but unfortunately the owner doesn't want to give way with it. But she will will it to me if she dies suddenly in a car accident or unforeseen circumstance. <laughs> Um, that's another picture of uh, the same bird, but in, in brighter daylight. So again, that, that yellow is, is more yellowy orange colour than the beautiful banana yellow of the, the sea and octra. Um, so basically, over the last four years, we've tried to trace back all the, the breeding lines of the scarlets. This basically came through from trying to find out uh, who all the original importers were into Australia. Once we found out who they were, we then approached these people to get them to send us photos of their, um, their scarlets. Unfortunately, 80% of the breeders had mixed the two subspecies together because back in the 90s, no one believed there were subspecies. So 
that was just a bigger macaw, that was a smaller macaw, that one's got more yellow, so on, or the bigger one's the cockbird, the smaller one's the hen. So we've basically searched the whole country to actually now find that we, we have acquired four birds now from different bloodlines. But our search will continue um, probably for another two, uh, two of them so that we can um, do unrelated um, because them. So if you look at the, the picture of the three of them together, you can see the, the reds are completely different. Um, the flight feathers on the, the Mako Mako, completely different to the other two. The, um, the Mexican is, is so much darker on the flight feathers, like a really dark blue compared to this sort of more of a, a navy blue and the difference in the yellows as well. So this you'll be able to read about in Tony Silver's uh, new book that's coming out this year. He's using all our data to actually um, put into his book, which is quite exciting for us. Uh, the importance of flocking our birds. We flock our, our birds every season. Um, the reason for this is because they're housed in uh, smaller enclosures for breeding, as we found the macaws do prefer to breed in a smaller aviary. We actually had them the first season breeding in um, like a flocking aviary, and all as the male did the whole time was search the perimeter, checking the perimeter, and not going anywhere near the, the hen. So once we actually reduced the size down, they started to breed. Um, also, it's great for natural flocking as well. So if you have pairs that aren't bonding or haven't bonded within a flocking situation, they'll actually choose their, their own partner. So as Nanda was saying before, you know, the arranged marriage is out and the love marriage is in. Um, with the bonding um, young macaws in with the older macaws, Again, is really good for the hand-raised macaws if they haven't sold for the pet market because they will learn from the, um, the birds that haven't been hand-raised um, how to be a macaw and not a human. Um, we, we keep back one chick from every pair to make up new bloodlines and new, and new pairs. And after seven years, the hand-raised...